Hello, my friends, and welcome to a video lecture on topic B4.1, Adaptation to Environment. Our guiding questions for today, how are adaptations and habitats of species related, and what causes the similarities between ecosystems within a terrestrial biome? And our objectives for today, we're going to define habitat, ecosystem, and biome. We're going to talk about some of the abiotic factors that affect the distribution of terrestrial biomes. Those are the biomes on land, not in the water. We're going to also talk about some of the abiotic factors that limit species distribution across the planet. And then we're going to talk about lots of examples of adaptations of organisms to their environments. Biomes are groups of similar ecosystems. Ecosystems are communities, those groups of populations living in the same place at the same time, and the abiotic factors with which those communities interact. So it makes sense that similar ecosystems, those biomes, are going to be distributed across the planet where there are similar abiotic factors. Habitats are these specific geographical or physical locations within the ecosystem where organisms live. Often it's not just where a species or an individual lives, but where there are communities living. Often we have communities sharing a habitat. Habitats are going to provide for the organisms in them, shelter, food, water, oxygen, and light. And we're focusing on these abiotic factors. A means without and bio means life. So these non-living factors that determine the distribution of these terrestrial or land-based biomes because it's these abiotic factors that actually determine what kind of biome can exist in different locations across the planet. These abiotic factors are also going to influence what adaptations evolve in the organisms in those biomes. Those adaptations are going to allow the organisms to take advantage of the habitats within those biomes. We're going to look at the most influential of abiotic factors and the two that are probably the most important are precipitation and temperature. And we can see on this graph that we have some deserts when it's very hot and very low precipitation, whereas we're going to have tropical rainforests where we've got lots of precipitation and lots of heat. Here are those six main terrestrial biomes that we are going to look at just a little bit. Temperature and precipitation are probably the most influential of those abiotic factors, but of course, they're not the only ones. Here I have added light intensity and some seasonal variations. And you can see that just one tiny little difference here between tropical rainforest and hot desert, things in terms of temperature are the same, light intensity is the same, seasonal variation is minimal, which means they don't really have seasons. Um, but that difference between precipitation from very high to very low takes us from a tropical rainforest to a desert. And these abiotic factors are going to limit the distribution of species across the planet as well. We've talked already quite a bit about water availability that's related to that precipitation and temperature ranges. We just added in the idea of light intensity and duration for how long each day or each season are the organisms having access to light. We're going to add in now soil composition, also super important for terrestrial or land-based biomes, and then pH and salinity. Salinity is saltiness. These are super important for our aquatic biomes. Each of these aquatic factors we can graph along this environmental gradient. So we can talk about temperature from low to high. We can talk about pH. We can talk about whatever. There's going to be some optimum tolerance range where we're going to find the most numbers of organisms because that's the best place for that abiotic factor. It's the most supportive of life. We find far fewer organisms in those stress zones because it's just not as easy to live in. And then in our zones of intolerance, literally intolerable, we're not going to find any organisms. Kind of cool thing about these individuals living in the stress zones, they have adaptations that allow them to not just survive, but perhaps even thrive by taking advantage of resources for which there isn't a lot of competition since they're in these stress zones. Some examples, polar bears are going to live where the air temperatures are quite a bit lower than what is optimum. And then we have our super cool thermophilic bacteria that live where it's quite hot. 
We remember when we talked about DNA polymerase, um, this idea of TAC polymerase that we use in PCR, polymerase chain reaction. This comes from the bacteria Thermus aquaticus, which lives in hot water, which is why we can use its polymerase in hot water in our thermal cycling for PCR. We're going to look at lots and lots of examples of habitats and the abiotic factors that organisms have had to adapt to. Our first example is the sea oat plant, which lives on sand dunes, which you can guess, it's probably pretty sandy. Cool thing about the sea oats, they have evolved to become quite drought resistant. They do that by having large, dense and shallow root systems. That shallow and large root system allows them to absorb lots of water very effectively while it's raining, since the sand is not very good at holding on to water the way that like clay soil might. Another benefit of this large, dense, shallow root system is that it is going to hold the sand in place if there's less erosion, which also means that the plant itself is not going to blow away. You can see here this ridge where the grass is rooted, and these ridges are coming from the root holding the sand in place. That sand is not getting blown away the way that it is perhaps over here where there isn't any grass. Another cool thing, these plants have very narrow leaves. That's going to prevent some water loss. They can tolerate sea spray, which has salt in them. And then they also have these super cool nodes and rhizomes near the base. What these guys do, because they're just above the surface of the sand, when they do get covered by sand because of tides or wind, they are going to actually stimulate growth of shoots just above the sand. This is asexual reproduction is going to allow the plant to survive even as the sand is getting deeper. There is also a sexual reproduction cycle, kind of like seeds of an oat plant, which is why we call it the sea oat. Another interesting organism that is adapted to a stress zone is the mangrove tree. Mangrove trees live in saltwater tidal zones where the salinity or the saltiness is a little bit higher than ideal. These guys, these mangrove trees, have both above and below water roots. The above water roots, here we can see them, absorb water and air. They have pores similar to stomata. The pores in the roots, though, are called lenticels, and they don't allow for the diffusion of water vapor out of them. Instead, they allow for the diffusion of oxygen gas in. And that oxygen gas is used to oxygenate the below water roots. And the below water roots are really good at filtering out salt because of course we don't want too much salt in the plant. That will make it hypertonic and this is problematic. Kind of cool thing about the root systems of the mangrove trees these root systems, you can see them here, also here along the edge of this lake. They're going to provide shelter for lots of marine animals. And I'm going to take a tiny little tangent and tell you um, about these three photos. I took these when I was in Thailand in the summer of 2024. So here we're walking along um, this path out to the dock on this lake. We were in Songkla in southern Thailand. These mangrove trees are the breeding grounds of these cutie patootie little baby crabs. And so we went out in the boat. Here's the edge of the boat that I was in. Um, and we had some crabs in buckets, these baby crabs. And we released them um, along the edge of the mangrove so that those crabs could grow up to be a little bit bigger and then hopefully make some babies so that the population of the crab in the lake here in Songkla could remain high. One more super cool thing about um, mangrove trees, their seeds will actually start to germinate before they fall from the parent tree. Here you can see this fruit, the seed of the mangrove, and it's got this super cool propagule. And it's basically the germination of the seed, even though it's still attached to the parent plant. Let me get rid of my scribble so that you can see it. This allows it to kind of set up a little bit of a stabilizing structure so that when it does fall from the parent plant, it doesn't sink too far into the water or float too far away from the tidal zone. Perhaps one of the most beautiful of ecosystems on planet Earth are the coral reefs. They have this very specific set of abiotic factors needed in order to form. 
Water depth needs to be less than 15 meters and the water has to have high clarity. That means it's not very cloudy or we like to use the word turbidity to describe cloudiness. Why do we need that clarity and a shallow water? It's because we need sunlight to be able to penetrate to the surface of the coral. Why does the coral need sunlight? Remember that coral has a symbiotic relationship with the photosynthetic bacteria, zooxanthella. Without sufficient sunlight, we don't have healthy zooxanthella, which means we don't have healthy coral. We also need to keep a pH above 7.8, also for the health of those zooxanthella. Salinity or saltiness needs to be between 32 and 42 parts per thousand. Temperature needs to stay in a range of 23 to 29 degrees Celsius. Those abiotic factors do exist through much of the world. You can see here all the dots are showing us where we have coral waters, and this is our coral reef biome. The hot desert biome also poses some challenges to organisms that are trying to take advantage of it as a habitat as it's both hot and dry. Here we're going to look at the fennec fox as an example of an organism that uses the hot desert as its habitat. It is nocturnal that allows it to avoid the hottest parts of the day. Its underground den allows it to escape the heat of the day. Um, the long thick hair is actually a great insulator both during the day's heat and the night's cold. Hairs on the foot pads are going to insulate the feet against getting burned by the hot sand. The pale coat is going to reflect the heat. Long ears allow for more cooling. So as blood flows through these ears, it, the high latent heat of the water in the blood is going to lead to the cooling of the body of the fox. And then this variable ventilation rate, this just means that the fox can pant, also allows it to cool. The saguaro cactus also lives in hot deserts. It has a very wide spreading root system and super deep tap roots that allows it to absorb water in the very infrequent times when it rains. It has super fat stems that allow it to store water and those stems are pleated. When it does rain, the pleats can pop out to hold on to all the extra water. When there's less water available, the pleats can go back in so that the plant doesn't have to like grow really big really fast in order to hold on to all the extra water. It's got vertical orientation of stems that's going to prevent exposure from the most intense of the sunlight. So when the sun is directly overhead and most intense, really only the tippy parts of the cactus are getting exposed. When the sun is a little bit more sideways, morning and evening, this is when the majority of the plant is getting exposed to the light. This is just so that the plant doesn't have overexposure. It's got a super thick cuticle, that waxy cuticle that prevents water loss by uh, evaporation. It has leaves that are reduced to spines. There is no need for this guy to have big broad leaves to capture lots of sunlight because access to sunlight is not a problem. Instead, the leaves are reduced to these spines that will prevent animals from coming to eat the cactus and steal its water. Finally, it has a super cool thing called cam metabolism where it's able to separate the light dependent and independent reactions just so that it's not consuming CO2 or losing water too fast during the daylight. And our last example of organisms living in their biomes, we're going to look at things that live in tropical rainforests. The first guy we're going to talk about is the Moranti tree and its adaptations. It's super tall. That allows it to compete for sunlight. However, being really tall brings about some challenges. The wind is more likely to not get down. The taller you are, the heavier you are, the more likely you are to fall. So in order to kind of combat some of these challenges of being tall, the Moranti also has really hard and dense wood, lots of lignin in its xylem. It's buttressed, that means all of these extra kind of layers around the trunk help to hold it up, stabilize its height. It also has a smooth trunk so that water just kind of flows right off. We don't want the water to get captured because that's going to add weight. The leaves are broad, that's for lots of sunshine capture, but they're also oval and pointed and that allows for the water to flow off really easily, again, so that we don't add weight. It's an evergreen. It carries out photosynthesis all year long. Its photosynthetic enzymes 
Rubisco are going to tolerate high temperatures since the rainforest does get pretty toasty. Finally, flowers and seeds are produced very infrequently, maybe just one out of five years. And the reason is because there is not a lack of animals to eat the seeds. It really doesn't want to spend the energy making lots and lots of seeds because they actually get eaten a little bit too well. One of the guys that might uh, live amongst those Maranti trees is the spider monkey. It has super long arms and legs so that it can swing through trees. Its hands are hook-like and thumbless, again, so that it can hold on to trees pretty well. Its feet also are able to grasp branches, as can its tail. The shoulders are super flexible. That allows for easy swinging. It has a highly developed larynx. It can make a lot of noises to communicate within its population. It's diurnal. It's going to take advantage of the light to find the food. And it has no specific breeding season because in the rainforest, there's always a lovely temperature and there's always easy access to lots of food. And on that note, my friends, we have accomplished our objectives. We talked about those vocabulary words. We talked about the abiotic factors that affect especially the distribution of terrestrial biomes. We talked about how we have those optimal zones and the stress zones and how that can limit species distribution. Then we also talked about lots and lots of examples of adaptations of organisms to their environments. Hopefully you're feeling pretty confident about answering our guiding questions, how those adaptations in the habitats are related, and then the similarities, especially of those abiotic factors amongst ecosystems that cause them to be a single biome.